So what this calculator is, it basically works out what price you should be paying for a property, so what price you're going to be reselling the property for. So let's go through this. So when you buy a property and when you're doing any renovation deal, you've got categories of costs that are going to come into play. And what this is, is basically your acquisition cost. Um, you've obviously got your purchase price, you've got acquisition costs. Your acquisition costs are all your things like your stamp duty, your legals, um, your finance costs are all your holding costs associated with the property. Your professional and other tends to be any sort of consultant, so due diligence costs or architect or draftsman, whatever they may, may be. You've got your renovation costs, which are your physical construction budget. You've got your resale costs to sell the property, your agent's commission, and you've got your capital gains tax as well. So um, regardless of whether you're renovating or developing, um, most property developers categorise those costs into, clump, into categories of costs. Now, so what we're going to do here is we're going to do this exercise, and I encourage you in your workbooks, also take out your workbooklet, okay, because we've actually got some practical examples that I want you to actually calculate in this particular session. Okay, so if you go to this resale calculator in your workbook as well, I'm going to do this because you have to understand this. All right. In your workbook, and just go, it says resale, price, uh, resale class exercise. It should be page one of your workbooks. The very first page. No, you're in the step-by-step -step guide. So not the step-by-step -step -step guide. We've got too many things. Workbooks. <laughs> It's the workbook. Um, it's the one with the staple document. It's this one here. Yep. Anybody not got the workbook? Yep. So it's the one that was handed out to you this morning as you come in. Yep. And there's one per couple. It was handed out this morning. Lisa, that was handed out this morning at reception on registration. So it was given to you this morning at registration. I'll hand it on. Thank you. Okay, so everybody, it's this document here, okay? It's just stapled together. Just a whole heap of crew down here, please. Crew down here. Okay, anybody not got that? Put your hands up if you haven't got it, please. There's one per couple. Have we got any spares of this? So we need one, two, three. So it was given to everybody at reception this morning, it should have been. Okay, and we've got a couple of crew questions. Okay, so the crew are just looking at that. One, two, three, four. About four will do it. Are there any couples that have got two at the moment? Okay, put your, put your little flags up if you need those. Okay. So in the meantime, I'll just keep working through that while we've got this. Okay, so when you buy a property, you've obviously got your purchase cost, okay? <clears throat> So your purchase price, let's say it's a $500,000 house. <clears throat> so your purchase price rec rec um, uh, resembles 100% of the purchase price. So let's say it's a $500,000 house, okay? And this is a cosmetic reno. Sorry, I've messed this up a little bit, sorry. Cosmetic reno. So this um, spreadsheet does both a cosmetic and a, a structural. And what we're determining is what price you need to sell a property for um, based on the asking price of the property, okay? All right, so purchase cost is 100%. That's 100% for a cosmetic and a structural, so that doesn't change, okay? So if you're buying a house for 500,000, you want to write 500 grand in that particular property in those boxes there. <clears throat> acquisition costs. So your acquisition costs are your legals and your stamp duty, and typically they tend to be about 4% of the purchase price. So if you grab your calculator, you do 4% of 100 of 500,000, what do you get? $20,000. So if you allocate $20,000 for your acquisition costs, that will cover all your stamp duty and your legals in acquiring that property. Okay, your finance cost. For a cosmetic renovation, it's approximately 4% of the property value. 
and for a structural renovation, it's 9.5. Now, guys, I always get asked questions. Somebody always puts their hand up in the audience and says, well, how do you calculate those figures? Um, with the finance cost for a cosmetic renovation, you can see I've got a fair few footnotes at the bottom of those calculators. So a cosmetic renovation is actually calculated. I've just allowed for an 8% per annum, so I've built a little bit of fat in. Obviously, interest rates are at the moment around 7 7 7.5%, 8%. So they're calculated at 8% interest rate per annum with 22 weeks holding time. So I've allowed for that six weeks cosmetic reno. I've allowed for six weeks for marketing. I've also allowed for six weeks on settlement on the other end. Okay, so all of that has been factored into the equation. Um, same with the structural renovation. Structural renovation factors in 8% interest rates and also factors in almost a year of holding costs. Now, these finance costs also include your construction budget as well. So the 10% reno cost, that money's got to be borrowed from somewhere. Either it gets borrowed or it's coming out of your cash. Even if it's coming out on cash, you should treat, still apply an interest rate to it because it's money that you could be earning interest. So there's a real cost of withdrawing that money. So that factors in the purchase price finance cost, but also the construction price finance cost as well, okay? So 4%. So we know that 4% of 500 grand is $20,000. And 9.5 of 500,000? 47.5, okay. 47,500. So your holding cost, if you're holding a structural renovation, 500 grand with a 10%, um, with a 40% renovation budget, your holding costs are going to be 47,500 that you need to factor into feasibility. Okay, your professional costs. Now your professional, um, typically, you don't typically have any professional costs for a cosmetic renovation. For a structural, what that would be is your draftsman fee, your architect, um, any due diligence cost, uh, any like structural engineer, hydraulic engineer, it will be all those, those suits. That, you know, the design team that I spoke to you about this morning. So normally don't have any with the cosmetic renovation, but what I've done is I've just built a little bit of fat in there to allow for any due diligence cost, okay, or just any other sort of quirky thing. You might have to get a surveyor, whatever it may be. So 0.5 of 500,000 is what figure? $500? Two and a half thousand. Okay, for a professional cost, it is 3%. So on a 500,000 house, 15 grand, expect to pay your architect, your draftsman, structural engineer, whatever it may be, no more than five. So that should determine, here, these are your budgets, don't go over that. So if you've got an architect that's coming back and saying, look, your D development application fee is going to be $15,000, it's way too expensive. You're spending more than what you should because that's got to cover your architect drafts, architect slash draftsman, depending on which one you go. Um, that's also got to cover your structural engineering drawings and your hydraulic engineering drawings as well and your surveyor. So 15 grand is your total budget for all of those things based on a $500,000 property purchase price. You've got your renovation cost. This is actually your physical construction budget. Okay. Now, how much do you spend with your renovations, regardless of whether it's structural or cosmetic? What's your percentage? 10% of the property value. So on a $500,000 house on a cosmetic reno, it's going to be, sorry, on a cosmetic reno, it's 10% it's uh, 10, 10 which is 50000 and 40% for a structural renovation. Do you remember that this morning from the basics? Okay. So that's going to be, what, 200000 So that's your construction budget for your... Structural reno, don't go a dollar over it. Your resale costs. Your resale costs are basically your agent's commission um, and also your advertising, your marketing fees as well. So that's all been factored into that as equation. So 4% for, cos uh, for a cosmetic reno and 5%. Now you work this, what confuses a lot of people, this figure is actually based on the purchase price, but there's fat being built into that. So it's really calculating it off the resale value. But obviously to get to that resale value, you can't, cal can't calculate a figure that's not there. So I've actually number crunched this many times over and it's, I've done it on lots of different examples and it works out perfectly this way. So trust me in that regard. So if you're selling a structural renovation, you need to allow 5% of the budget. So we know that 5% is what? Um, 25 grand, so that's what your agent's commission and your marketing costs are going to be, and 4% is $20,000.
Now, this week, I actually just rejigged these calculators this week because I had a few students saying, well, shouldn't you really be factoring capital gains tax into the equation as well? The reality is some of you here are not going to incur capital gains tax because you'll be by renovating and renting. Um, some of you will take a long-term view. So the tax rate can change so drastically. But needless to say, I just rejigged it this week. So if you want, you can take the capital gains tax out. This is a worst case scenario. So for capital gains tax, so again, those figures don't sound right, but they actually are um, and I've modelled that many times over to make sure that's correct. So 4.5%, 22.50 and 37.500? 37 even or 37.5? 37.5, okay cool. So if you actually, um, now your profit margin, now on a cosmetic reno you want to be aiming for 15% margin you might be happy to work for 10% margin. Whatever, whatever figures you want to work with, like I would encourage you not to change all of these figures, but if you're happy to work for a smaller profit margin, you can tweak these figures. I've based it on a 25% profit margin for a structural. Um, so these calculators you've also got in Microsoft editable format, so you can actually change all these formulas to suit yourself. So if you don't want to make any allowance for capital gains tax, you can completely take that out. So your profit margin on a cosmetic reno is 15%. 75,000. So some of you might be happy to work for 10, do a quick cosmetic reno and work for 10, make a 50 grand profit margin. I'm sure there's lots of people in this room would be happy. So obviously if these figures are smaller, then it's going to be easier to do a deal. But please don't just fudge these ones up here because these are true costs that I know you're going to incur. 25% um, for a structural, what's the, what's the profit margin there? Okay, so if you add up the total cost there, What you should get seven hundred and ten grand. Is that right? Yeah. And five hundred thousand times nine seventy. All right, so if you can do these quick, so that's basically what it's saying is that if you're buying a $500,000 house and you're doing a cosmetic renovation, you need to be reselling it at around 700 grand to basically cover all your costs and make your desired profit margin, okay? If you're doing a structural renovation, if you're buying at 500, you need to be reselling at around 970, almost a million bucks, basically. You've almost got to double the value if you're doing a structural renovation, okay? That's where you take a two-bedroom house to a four-bedroom house, for example. Um, so what, what you want to do is before you even start analysing, go to the extent of doing your property, individual property due diligence, it's a good idea just to check these figures first because the reality is if this doesn't stack up, then you're not even going to bother doing all the property due diligence, okay? So they're very quick calculators to work out what you need to be reselling. And what you're going to do is you're going to basically um, use your property due diligence, which I'll go through uh, uh, shortly. Your property due diligence system is going to tell you whether or not it stacks up. If it stacks up, great. You continue on with step number property three, doing your individual. And if it doesn't, file it away in your property due diligence system and continue looking for another deal. All right, the second calculator is what's called the purchase price. I'll quickly take the question there, sorry. Sorry, Shuri, uh, just it's the acquisition cost that includes the stamp duty yes. as well, does it? Okay. Yep. So I'll leave that up for you. Now, the, the, cal the other one, the purchase price calculator, quite often you may know what you know, three-bedroom houses sell for in your area. So what you might, so you might know that, um, like me, for example, I know that three-bedroom you know, three houses in Balmain sell anywhere between 900 to 1.4. So what you can do is this particular calculator, the purchase price calculator, works back to determine what you should actually be buying for a property. So let's say you know that three bedroom houses sell for a million dollars in Balmain. What you do, and let's say it's a cosmetic renovation opportunity, so you just take the same figures, 142%. So you obviously all those figures equated to 142% at the bottom. All you do is a million, divide 142%. You grab your calculator and work that out. Divide 142%. It means I should be paying $704,225 for that unrenovated cosmetic reno. Now, if the agent's got the property on the market for $800,000, is that a deal? No. Well, it could be a deal. 
but you need to get the price down around the 700 to 100 grand over price. So that's where you start negotiating with the agent and say, look, the property is only stacking up at seven. I'm interested in the property, but it's only stacking up at around 700. The most I can afford to pay you is 704,000 based on my financial feasibility. Now, can you see how I'm using this sort of language now? See, instead of just going, most people, when a property comes on the market, it's 800,000 or whatever it may be, 780,000. Most people just go, oh, okay, um, look, I'll, I'll give you 750. They just pluck figures out of the air. And this is how you're going to start to become taken a bit more seriously by the agent. Don't be scared to show them your templates. Like, don't be scared to take this in and show them your figures. Say, Chris, I'm really interested in this unrenovated house. You know, I'm very keen on buying it. But based on my, my high level feasibility, the price that I can only afford to pay for this property where it stacks up for me to actually make some profit margin is only $704,000. More than happy to give you that. But at the moment, the property is sitting over, it's approximately $80,000 over where it's feasible for me to flip it for a profit. Do you have a question there? Yeah. No, that's all taking all of that into consideration. So your acquisition cost includes, that's everything. Yeah, but I couldn't go to the agent then and say, well, I've got 704. Yeah. Then he's not the one that actually adds, do you know what I mean? Like You're covering it in there. So you're prepared to pay 704000 which covers the expense. It's irrelevant who pays the stamp duty. Like, you have to pay that as the buyer. But this is you actually buying an unrenovated property and flipping it and making a profit at the end. So if you can't make a profit from the project, you might as well stay on the lounge and watch Oprah all day um, rather than going out and trying to do it, you know, buy a property that's never going to make you any money. So you have to go back to the agent and say, I'm interested in buying it, but the price where it's feasible for me to make some margin on it is 704000 And that acquisition, that stamp duty is built into those costs that you've already factored in. So you don't add that on top. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, same with the structural renovation. If you're doing the structural renovation, you're going to take the same figure, a million dollars, and what figure are you going to divide it by, guys? 194%. So if we do that calculation, has anybody done it? Divide 194%. You're paying $515,463. Now, if they want 520000 or 530000 for the property, you can do business because you're really close to that mark. So use these two calculators. As I said, don't be scared to take those into your real estate agent and show them the figures because um, if you can justify your rationale, um, it's going to just put you in a much better for the position for them to take you a bit more seriously. Okay. You're going to get that from your due diligence system. Yeah, so I'm about to take you through that. So it'll make sense in a second. All right. And you just know what properties sell for. You'll get to that level where you know what properties sell for in your area. That's all part of your due diligence. Okay. Do we need to do an exercise? Do you want to do that exercise where you work that out yourself? Let's do that because I, I want you to understand that. So in your manuals, um, in your workbooks there, did everybody get their workbooks? Yeah? Still got them? Yep. Yeah. Um, beautiful. So what I want you to do is I want to do a class exercise with you. So in their workbook... Turn to your resale price calculator, your blank resale, there's a sh an explanation sheet there. Basically, I want you to calculate the resale price required on an unrenovated house with a purchase price of 440000 and I want it, you to do it for a cosmetic renovation and a structural renovation. I'm going to give you five minutes to do this. If you're stuck, please turn to your neighbour and help each other out. Four, four, uh, 440 is it? 440, yep. So you, there's actually a sheet there um, in your workbook that explains that. So it should be the, one of the first, first or second sheet in your book. Anybody stuck? If, you're, if you need help, put your red flag up and the crew will come and help. Anybody stuck? If you're stuck, don't be bashful. We've got lots of people on hand to help. Okay, um, guys, Julie, Marianne? Stuck? I have a question. Question? Yeah, I'll grab a mic microphone down here, guys. Please, mic. mic. Yeah, now? Yeah. Okay. Say, for example, in, in the first instance, what we just went through. Yes. Okay. And you're doing these numbers, and it's on the same property, for example, and you can go into it with the strategy of cosmetic. Yes. Or structural. Yes. Okay. 
So obviously there's a difference between the price you should pay at cosmetic level of 704 mm -hmm. and then structural at 515. Like, how do you find this in the marketplace, for example, if you're going to an auction and say, for example, you know, Gabriella and I are going in and we're bidding for the same yep. property, mm -hmm. <laughs> she's prepared to pay more under cosmetics. Yep. And then I'm, you know, 200 odd thousand less than, obviously, I'm going to miss out on the property. Yep, absolutely. And what, you just walk away in that instance? Yeah, I mean, you can't pay more for a property than what the numbers stack up. So, and don't, don't assume that everybody will, um, I mean, normally with structural renovations, you can normally tell what's an underutilised property. So, but saying that some people may take a long-term view, particularly owner occupiers will just take mm. a long-term view and they'll say, look, I'll buy it now, I'll tart it up, and then I'll basically do a structural reno in three years' time. And unfortunately, um, you'll miss out on that property. And that's why it's really important to try and be proactive so you can be trying to get these properties before, before they go on the market. Because yeah. sometimes if you, if you wait till they're on the market, exactly. look, some properties like deceased estates, you have to buy them on the market. Mm. So you just win some, you lose some. I, I bid on a lot of properties uh, that I just can't buy. I'm competing against uneducated people who are just working mm. on figures that are totally unrealistic. I'm working on other, you know, against other people who are just taking a long-term view in the property. They get emotional. Mm. They just go crazy. So the reality is sometimes you can't seize the properties. And that's why you, the sooner you can try and get them. I and think that's before why going to, yeah, yeah, to auction. Then absolutely. Because I think... I mean, I appreciate what you're saying, yep. but it's, there's a lot of fat in that Absolutely. <laughs> for you to get your profit yep. and you're competing against the general market. Yeah. You'll find it, um, where you'll find this issue is in the inner city locations. Um, you'll find it much harder in the outer metropolitan suburbs where there's not that hysteria associated mm. with the inner city demand. Um, it'll be much easier to get the deals because the properties sell slower. Fair enough. Yep. Yeah. So that's where I'm saying, guys, you might don't all mm. tar, don't all come into the inner city. I'm not saying that because I don't want you to come on my turf. I couldn't care less. But what I'm saying is I want you to be able to do deals and make it find it easy to find deals. So that's why I tend to push a lot of students out into the metropolitan suburbs. You know, suburbs like Gladesville, Partney, Lane Cove. They're all over the place. Haberfield, Sutherland, wherever, um, because it's so much easier just to find the deals. Actually, get past first base. So if you are going to concentrate on the inner city locations, you have to be prepared to fight hard for the properties. That's reality. And that's why those agents, those agents relationships are critical. Okay, guys, let's go through this, okay? Um, all right, what figure did you get? Purchase price. So we know the purchase price is going to be 440 on both columns. 440. Acquisition cost to what? 17,000. Did everybody get that? Okay, so same over here, 17.6. Finance cost, 17.6. What's 9.5 equal? 41,900. 800. Okay, professional cost, 22. This end? 13.2. That's not right. Thirteen two. Oh, just two. That seemed didn't seem right. Okay, ten percent. We know that forty four thousand is your cosmetic reno budget for a property at four forty. At um, forty thousand, what's that? One sixty. One seventy six. Okay, great. Um, what's your capital gains tax on a cosmetic reno? Is that what you got? 19,800, everybody? Okay, great. Um, capital gains tax, 7.5. Okay, profit margin, 15%. What are we going to make? As long as it's not 666, that's a good number. Um, all right. I was actually born on Friday the 13th. Can you believe it? And uh, my daughter was actually... Um, uh, almost born on the 6th of June 2006, so 666. I thought that's a bit freaky that the mum's born on Friday 13th and the daughter almost on 66. Anyway, okay, it's a different story. Um, 110? Oh, I missed the resale cost. Bad girl. Um, we'll just put that down there. Okay, what's the resale cost? Okay, great. And Risa, I think, was it 4% over here? 4%, yep. And what's the resale cost over here? Yep. And what's the figure? Okay, so what are the total costs that you get?
Okay, great. And over here? You know what? It's actually quicker if I just do it myself. Because um, I'm getting all different figures um, thrown at me. So 142, 624, 800. Is that what you all get? Yes. Beautiful. Okay, and 440 times 194% is 853,600. Yes. Beautiful. Anybody get, that cor- uh, anybody get that wrong? Okay, all understand that? Okay, so very quick way for you to work out, just weed out, um, because what you want to do is, that's what I call a high-level feasibility, don't ever buy a property just based on that, okay? So um, it's just a really quick high-level tool, and if it gets past that first check, we're now going to go into property due diligence mode. Okay, all right, purchase price calculator, so we've gone through that as well, so um, let's do the quick class example with that one, so I want you to work out, moving into the next spreadsheet, for a property that's been on the market, sorry, we know that houses in your area sell for 1.2 million. So can you work out what price you should be paying for a property, um, knowing that you can resell it for 1.2 for both a cosmetic and a structural? Okay. Okay. For a cosmetic renovation, did you all get 845,070 dollars? Okay, great. And for a structural, 618,556 dollars. Beautiful, well done, guys. All right. Now, if you really want to get smart, when you actually um, submit your offers to agents, what you can do is actually put that exact price and they'll actually think there's some theory behind it as well. There actually is. But uh, most people just pluck figures out of the air. So, yep. Question at the back. Hi, hi Sherry. Hi. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, you know, this morning I was asking about the uh, insurance cost. Yes. Will that be factored in under finance cost in the feasibility study or...? What would that fall under? Um, insurance, as in like your workers' comp, that is a separate business expense that's got nothing to do with your project. No, so the, um, part of the cost. Mm-hmm. The insurance, like your workers' comp? Um, it's, it's more a business cost. So there's going to be some costs that you'll incur as a business um, because those costs will go right across all of your projects for a one-year period, so it doesn't include insurance. No, just to insure the house itself. Is, is the cost of insuring the house just as... The, bu- the structure insurance, is that included in this? No, because it's a, it's, a, it's a business expense, not a project expense. Right. So that's not, no, it's a separate thing. It's, like, it's almost like saying, um, you, you know, to get your corporate ID, um, whether that's a project cost, it's not really, it's a business cost. So, yeah, these are, these are just solely project cost. So we're going to go through the individual factors that you should research on a property before you actually buy, okay? Now, um, we obviously started yesterday with um, just some of the basic things you need to do in terms of doing the high-level feasibilities, and we're now going to go through and look at the individual things that you should just check before you actually buy, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that you don't buy a lemon again, okay? So um, now these are on the property due diligence checklist, so that's already been done for you. So um, you don't have to go through the manuals every time you're looking at researching a property. So just use these quick checklists. And all you've got to do is got to go tick, 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 tick. I've done that. I've researched that, done none of that. And then away you go. And if all of that stacks up and there's no major issues with the initial property due diligence, that's where you're then going to move to step number four and work out what value, what scope of work actually exists in the property. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Okay, so first thing, we said yesterday you do your high-level feasibility. You then go and do a physical inspection of the property. That's where you go through, you you open the cupboard doors, you you walk around the room, you know, you tread on the floorboards, make sure it's not sagging in one corner, check walls, basically go right over the whole property, check it thoroughly, document that in the property inspection checklist, okay? What you then do, so you obviously do the private inspection with the agent, so you do all of that in private. Don't do it in a public setting with other people there because, as I said, that's your intellectual property that you're gaining from that property. Now, um, one of the things that you should do when you are looking at um, doing your property due diligence, you should research the properties at different times of the day. So in an ideal world, you'd have you'd drive past in the morning, you'd drive past at lunch, you'd also drive past at night time, preferably on a weekday and also a weekend if time allows. Now, sometimes you won't have the opportunity. Sometimes you'll need to make a fairly quick decision to take a hot property off the market and you may not be able to do that. But it is a good idea to try and look at a property at different times because, as I said,
Some very quiet streets can suddenly become very busy streets from 6 till 9 a.m. in the morning, from 5 till 7 p.m. at night. A lot of streets, particularly in the inner city, um, they appear to be quiet, but then suddenly, uh, you know, the traffic goes through. So, and you won't really know this unless you live in the suburb as well or unless you check it at different times of the day. Just on my current site that I brought, um, a classic example was the open for inspection was held at a time when the planes don't go over the property. So real estate agents are very sneaky with things like this. Um, so I guess from my, when I bought, I bought that property quite quickly, um, and I don't regret buying that property because I certainly make fantastic money on it, but the reality is it was timed, the open inspection was timed at a certain time for a reason because that was the quietest time. So when I went through, it was about two o'clock in the afternoon, there weren't many planes going over. Um, if I'd probably gone and, you know, in lunchtime, I would have seen, you know, straight in the fight path. So they're the sort of examples as where it's, it's useful to actually check out a property at different times of the day. Okay, does a property have any heritage restrictions or any of those conservation blankets put over it? And what you can do is, again, this is very simple. You just go simply go straight into council. You go to the customer service desk. Just want to do a council search on a number of things and make sure there's no heritage restrictions. Don't freak out at the prospect of buying a heritage uh, listed property. You've just got to be aware that if you are dealing with a heritage listed property, you're going to have some controls put on you as to what you can and can't do with that particular property. But I certainly make made over three quarters of a million dollars um, doing a straight subdivision on a heritage listed property. I made that money because everybody got so scared of the fact that it had the heritage listing label. So you've got to really know what's fact from fiction. Okay, does the property have good access to essential infrastructure? So where you're buying, if you're looking at a property, you have to quickly analyse or quickly look at the fact that does it have essential infrastructure that people can live day-to-day -day lives. So things like a supermarket, a hospital, you know, a medical centre close by or a reasonable distance. So people have to live day, normal day-to-day -day lives and you've got to make sure. So again, a very quick check. You can just drive around the seas. Like these are really easy things to do. Just a quick check. Make sure, yep, this is going to be an okay suburb for somebody to live a normal life in. Okay, does the property have good access to public transport links? So is there a bus station, a bus, you know, a bus depot? Is there trains? Um, can they catch, if they don't have a car, can they get in and out of where they need to be um, in that respect? So again, you know, you'll see these sorts of things when you drive around the streets, you'll see how far away a property is from the local bus, um, the bus depot. Is that what they call it? Bus... Bus stop, that's it, bus stop. Couldn't think of the word, it's having a blonde moment. Um, the bus depot is actually where they all congregate. The bus stop, is, a local, is there a bus stop? Is it, you know, five kilometres down the road or is it 500 metres down the road? So it's simple little checks like that. Okay, does the property have good access to schools? The reality is, as renovators, you're all going to be targeting owner-occupiers. That I know, okay? And it'll either be young couples that you're going to target if it's a smaller property like a semi, or you're going to be doing moving, starting to renovate family homes, three or four-bedroom family homes. So the reality is, good chance um, whoever your buyer is going to be is going to have children, and they want to make sure that there are local schools in close proximity so they can actually get their kids off to school. People don't want children to um, have to travel long distances to go to school. So make sure there's good, it's your suburb, your property is serviced by good schools. Okay, does the property have good access to recreational facilities? So things like parks are a big attractor to properties. So if your property is located close to parks, and what I may say close, I don't mean like right next door, but you know, is it a short walk away that, so that families can actually just take their kids for a leisurely stroll on a Sunday morning and, and play around in the park for an hour? If your property is not located next to a plaque, it's no big deal. Like it's not the deciding factor whether or not you buy a property, but in an ideal world, you would have that checked. Okay, does the property have any adverse um, industrial activity or retail or business activities? So you need to make sure that um, the property that you're buying is not located too close to the lifestyle strip. Remember yesterday I said with the Cafe Society? It's great to be close to that, but you don't ever want to be too close to it. So um, normally the reason why is because they have um, all that commercial business activity has traffic. So you don't ever want to be uh, like five doors. One of my students, um, before she did my workshop, had a property and it was 
she was pretty much the cafe strip was here and she was about 10 doors up from the last ca- like the last shop on the retail strip and the reality was is that a lot of cars um, still drove past her property looking to park and then walk down into the strip so you just don't ever want to be too close so as I said yesterday my recommendation is that always buy at least one block to two blocks back from the infrastructure they're the sort of ideal properties because what, what you then do is you eliminate the buyer objections of being too close to the infrastructure. Okay, are there any noise impacts associated with the property? So the reality is, um, you know, wherever we go, there's always noise of some, some way, shape or form. The biggest noise uh, in devaluer of property is obviously aircraft noise, so people don't like it. So you just have to make sure that um, if your property suffers from noise in any part in regard. So aircraft noise, um, it's also noise from main roads and arteries. So sometimes you can buy a street. I'll give you an example. One of my students uh, who was targeting the Pimble area, I went out and she said, look, you know, this great unrenovated house, it was a beautiful structural renovation, but it was backing onto the back of Ride, uh, Ride Road, um, which, you know, which is obviously a major artery. Now, it was one street back, so it wasn't right on the main road, it was one street back, but it was high up on the hill. And when I went out to the rear of the yard looking at this site for her, I, all you could hear was this buzz, this constant buzz of the road because the property was elevated up high. And for me, I said, well, you know, you don't really want to be, you know, for me, this is an issue because the reality is if somebody's going, if you're going to come in and do a renovation where you're going to put big bifold doors to the back of the property and it's going to be opening up onto the rear yard, which I'm a big fan of doing and I'll certainly talk about that this morning. Um, what you don't want is to be hearing that constant buzz of traffic and trucks going by in the middle of the night. You just don't want to hear that. So that is a buyer objection that you can never, ever overcome as renovators. So people, so people who are seriously looking at buying your property, who are taking a long-term view on it, will always look at those sorts of things. So noise is a very big one for me. Um, if a property had severe noise, um, it would be uh, you know, a very hard decision for me to buy a property, unless it is a hot suburb where, you know, Leichhardt is probably an exception where it's an extremely hot suburb, but people will just, because they're such, it's a lifestyle suburb and there's high pent-up demand, they're probably the only times that you would buy, but generally you want to try and avoid noise. I gave you also an, uh, an example yesterday about the shunting noise. That, you remember that one yesterday morning at 10 o'clock? Um, 10 p.m., all those properties suffered that shunting noise of the bang, 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 whatever, from the, um, from the ships taking all the cars overseas. So sometimes when you go there at, at during the day, you wouldn't be exposed to that, and that's why I'm saying if you can try and go at different times of the day, you might unravel some of these things. Okay, check to see if the property is in a flood-prone zone. You would be amazed, normal blocks, some blocks of land that you would never think have any flooding issues actually are flood-prone lots. Um, I know this is particularly prevalent in Brisbane for all the Brisbane people, okay? So what you do, where are you going to find out this information? Your yeah, local council. So most people don't do that council search. It only takes half an hour of your time to go to the council. So go there with your little list. I probably should even do a template for that. Um, um, uh, Jules, can you make a note of that template as to what to do in council? All right, so you can just take a little council checklist to go boom, boom, boom. Would that help you? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll do it for you next week. <laughs> um, I'll make it a little pretty too. And so um, what we do is go into council, go, OK, I need to check this. Has it got heritage? Has it got fraud prone? Um, has there been any past development applications? Boom, boom, boom. It literally takes you 10 minutes and you'll eliminate some of those issues with the property. So very easy to do. Um, in fact, one of my, one of my properties, uh, who went through my Mort Street property recently on the Stuart's Adele tour? Okay, I've actually just received a notification from council that they're going to deem that a flood prone lot. Because and I'm, I was like, what? I was exactly saying, thing, what? Um, so now I'm fighting the council, I'm going to be objecting to that um, issue. So in my property, sometimes some quirky little things happen like this in your property. So on, on that particular site, that's the front of the property where the front gate is and the house is here. Basically the lot next door, this house over here has got severe flooding. There's, there's, uh, there's stormwater pipes and stuff underneath this lot up here. And what they're saying is that, and this property suffers a little bit of flooding, and what they're saying to me here is that in, in 800 mils in this corner right here, my site with the 100 year flood may get some flooding 
in that very little corner. So now they're going to tag my site as a flood prone lot. Now for me as a property developer, I'm going to fight that tooth and nail and I don't care if it costs me $20,000 to do it in legal fees, but I will fight that because the reality is if I ever wanted to sell that property and people go to council and they say it's a flood prone lot, that is not going to sell. That will devalue that you know, $2.2 million house um, by potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that is a normal lot in a normal street that you would never ever dream of had, having flood prone issues. So that's what you want to check. Uh, where's Mike? Yeah. Um, could, could you gift that section to the council? Uh, no way. Just that um, tip and then no. save, no? No. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's probably not such a silly suggestion, but um, no, I'll, on I, I won't have to. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll fight that tooth and nail. They've actually had an independent flood study. Um, that I think they spent millions of dollars for these people to crunch the figures and blah, 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 blah. So I've basically said to them, well, I want evidence. So they did it on a general um, street basis. I'm like, well, how do you know my site has been affected by this? And um, they said, well, if you want to know if your site specifically is, we'll need to do the independent analysis on your site. So I said, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and do that. So that'll probably cost me five, ten grand, whatever it is, through a hydraulic engineer. But is it worth it? Yeah. Absolutely. That is actually only an imaginary line as well. It's not real study. Um, yeah. This, uh, it was brought in, I think, about 20 years ago where yeah. they, they started. It's for insurance reasons. That's all it's for. Because uh, yep. I've got a fellow that could help you with that. Yep. yep. Okay, good. We'll be talking. All right. So, yes. Hi, Sheree. Hi. Um, where the properties have been green-belted or partially green-belted, yep. um, where I live, there's a lot of developments going up. And probably about five, ten years ago, the council at that area at that time decided to green-belt and not notify people. Yep. My particular property is six acres and probably one-eighth right at the far corner because there's some gum trees. It's green belted, so we can't... When you say green, I've never heard of that term. You mean that protection of trees? Well, they can't, it's, can't be developed. Yep. Ever. It, it's, but it's um, an area that's dominated by a specific type of tree? Four trees. Yeah, okay. So guys, with, with councils, councils are absolutely vigilant with trees. And so, and actually I don't think that's probably one of the jujilies. That's a good thing I might should add to the system. So if you're one of the factors that when you are buying a site, you need to look at trees, um, particularly eucalypts um, and native trees. Councils absolutely protect them with absolute vigilance. There is a fine. If you cut down a eucalyptus tree, anything over three metres in height, you're looking at a fine generally of about 1.1 million for a tree. So there was a guy uh, recently out in um, Riverston who basically went on the Tex Texas Chainsaw Massacre with, uh, and chopped down like 110 trees in a couple of days and uh, it hit the news and he was looking at massive fines. Um, it's not a bunch of tree-hugging hippie crap. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, so yeah, so trees, uh, so I guess as structural renovators, what you need to be careful of trees, you might come in and you've got a normal site, let's say, you know, my site here, and you'll have a backyard and the house is underutilised and you'll have, you know, a big eucalypt right here or sometimes it'll be right there, whatever, and you'll have some down in the backyard, let's say you've got one there. Now you want to come in as a renovator and do a structural alteration and, and basically expand the house right out here, but there's a tree. If you think you can knock down that tree right in the path of construction, think again, okay? Now sometimes you get lucky and you're allowed to take it away, particularly if it's too close and the roots are upending the house, then you might be lucky. Um, have you ever seen properties where they've developed, they've gone around it? That's for a reason. They're not really being architectural. It's just the fact that um, they've had to work around the tree issue. So be very careful with trees. Sorry. <laughs> just and street trees, yeah. Okay. Sorry, Sheree, just one other thing. Yes. Um, I'm studying law as well, so my lecturer had the same issue. She wrote to her local council and quoted a particular case. She's got four kids under five. This particular case, the family had been applying to the council, can we cut it, can we cut it? They just said no. Storm happened, he was killed. The husband was killed and um, that family are now suing the council. So she quoted that case. Yep. The council have gone, okay, we're sending someone next week. Yes. 
So that's just something to bear in mind. Yeah, Obviously, absolutely. I'm not a lawyer, but that's she is, and she told yeah. me about that case. So if you get into that, yeah, and there's a family. Um, a, a similar situation with the development that I did last year. I built a big house at Pimble, and uh, Pimble was full of trees, and the pool that had a big eucalyptus that was hanging overhanging the pool. So I basically got an arborist out and said, look, I want to basically take this tree away, and it was actually really close proximity, like it was overhanging the roof. It was a massive tree. And um, got an arborist out and they said to me, Sharif, you want to take this tree, be prepared to fight this in Parliament because um, I said, your local council are not going to approve it. So, uh, and that was a safety risk, so very similar things. So sometimes, you know, they just don't see common sense, councils don't see common sense, such as the trees are highly protected. So just be very conscious of that when you're dealing with, you're thinking about a structural reno, you've got to take that into consideration if it's in the course of where potentially your new extension might be. Okay, contamination. Most people would think that sites aren't contaminated. Would you agree with that? What used to happen years ago is that um, particularly a lot of sites in the inner city are contaminated. There's also a lot of sites just generally that are contaminated. Years and years ago, um, you know, and I'm talking like 50, 100, 150 years ago, whatever it may be, um, a lot of home-based businesses existed. And so people used to work out of their, um, they used to have big sheds and things. And then obviously over time, the sheds have disappeared and the land has been subdivided and cut up and made it into smaller lots. So quite often you'll buy these sites where when they've had these home-based businesses, I'll give you an example, my current site is a contaminated site. So you would look at it and you would never think it's a contaminated site. But they used to have, um, used to manufacture cane furniture on that site in the olden days. So they used to tip a lot of varnish and stuff just on the ground and let it absorb into the soil. So quite often you can actually buy sites where they do have contamination. Don't freak out at the word contamination. Like I buy, have bought a lot of sites that are contaminated. Contamination is a problem. And what do we do with problems? We eat them for breakfast, right? So there's a solution. It's like asbestos. You know, people freak out about asbestos. It's a problem, but it's a solvable problem. So the co uh, contamination is quite expensive to... Um, the reality is it is expensive to take away. So most people wouldn't do a contamination test. I would say that if you've got an overly big block of land, it's probably worth paying $1,000 for a geotech, and I will talk about this in step number six tomorrow, the types of consultants for your development application process. But if you're doing, sorry, if you're doing a cosmetic reno, you don't need to worry about contamination. You can still have, still have contaminated land and do a cosmetic reno, that's no problem. It's just that when you're doing a structural renovation where you're going to start moving soil, then contamination becomes an issue. And you can get a geotech in. What they'll do is they'll basically come to your site, they'll come with a big corkscrew, so they'll basically drill down into the ground, they'll take up a little sample pile, they'll put in a glass, Vegemite jar, whatever it may be, they'll take that back to the lab, they'll pour it out, they'll analyse what the composition of the soils is and they'll, get, they'll assess it based on certain readings and they'll tell you whether or not your site has to basically, yep, whether you have to take out some of the soil. So on my current site I had to scrape off 400, you know, 400 mil just from the whole courtyard area. You know, it cost me five grand um, for the whole tagging and soil and geotech but you know, again it was worth it so I just built that into the feasibility. So if you can do a contamination test on for bigger sites, I would probably encourage you to do that. Do you know what your numbers are for um, getting rid of like a truckload or whatever? Yeah, very expensive. So it depends on the type. There's different categories of waste. Um, so if it's only just minor contamination, it's sort of like a category one. Um, it's, they don't title it category, there's certain categories. Um, and then like the next level up will be another category. So on my current site, it's the most toxic. Um, so what happens is you can't just ring any excavator or any truck driver to come and, and take that soil away. It's, it's all got to be tagged, so it's got to be recorded. Um, an arbor, uh, sorry, a geotech has to be on site. They have to basically see the contaminate the soil being removed. They have to tag that it's been on the truck and that truck's got to go to a special waste station that takes that particular type of waste. So it's got to be documented all down the chain and then those receipts have to be provided to council to prove that you've disposed of it in a proper fashion because uh, I guess what's happened in the past is that some, you know, any old truck driver has come along and dumped it in the general waste or they've just gone and dumped it in somebody's paddock, you know, um, bush reserve or something like that and it's been toxic material. So, yeah. Um, that's my background. I'm an environmental consultant. Oh, um, this is particularly important if you're buying in an urban renewal area yes. and you may, may not 
know anything about it until you put your DA into council. That's right. Um, how you can find out, I know you've got council up there. Some local governments are absolutely hopeless yep. at tracking this. Every state environment department has a register. So, um, And what's the register called just for the purpose? It's just called a contaminated land register. Cont so they Google contaminated land register? Well, you probably need to just find out who your state environment department is. They're called different names in each state. Yep. And I'd just call reception and say, can I speak to someone in regards to... Um, finding out if a property is listed on the contaminated land register. Okay. They are online, some of them, and you can pay a fee and access them, but, you know, if you can't find your way around or find it, just ring the department. Okay, cool. Okay. Can I add on to that as well? Because my partner actually works for, has worked for the EPA and um, Sydney Water All in contaminated lands. Yep. <laughs> he cleans up contaminated lands. And there was just one thing, Sheree, you said you don't have to worry about contamination if you're only doing a cosmetic. cosmetic. But if your land is contaminated and it's actually going to move off onto your neighbour's yes. land, you do have to worry because if you own that, you will be responsible. Yeah, so it's just if you don't touch the land, though, generally don't yeah, have to. No, but it's if undisturbed. But, yeah, if you are shuffling soil. Well, yep. not even if you're shuffling soil. If there's something there like a petrol tank yep, come and that, that actually yep. leaks and goes onto your neighbour's yes. land, um, you will be liable for that Absolutely. even if you haven't disturbed the land. Yep. All right, um, ensure the property is not too close to infrastructure so that we've covered that already. So um, this is an example, an aerial picture. This is one I was looking for yesterday. So this is obviously the main strip in my suburb. Um, all retail shops, cafe, like lifestyle strip is along here. So guys, what you're aiming for is that for me, um, in fact, I'll just go over this for the property, for the people that haven't attended my preliminary seminar. Mort Street, and Mort Street this is a property that I own in, in Mort Street. Um, property is basically from this corner to this corner is about 400 metres. Uh, from this corner to this corner is about 800 metres. Now, all the housing types are very consistent. They're all three to four bedroom family homes. There's a couple of, uh, you know, a strip of small two bedroom semis, but predominantly three to four bedroom family homes right along the whole strip. Now, these property values from this corner to this corner struggle to even reach 900 to a million dollars. Um, same size properties from this strip to this strip pull somewhere between 1.4 to 2.2 million, 2.3 million on average across, that, across this section here. Now, what happens is that as, an, as a renovator, you know, a property might come up here, let's say number 23 Mort Street comes up, you know, a good unrenovated house, clearly got potential to do a cosmetic or a structural reno. Um, people come in, agents ask, Christy agents asking 900 grand for it. What happens is people come in, they grab their, you know, their RP data reports or their home price guide that they've pulled from the internet. They come in and they say, well, these properties sold here for one point, this one here sold for 1.85, you know, according to my suburb report, this one here sold for 1.75. They only want 900,000 for this, hmm, seems cheap. Maybe we'll spend a couple of hundred grand on it. We should be able to easily sell it for 1.5 million. Now, the problem is, is that this, because this section here is located so close to the main drag, it's a buyer objection that people just won't want to buy those properties because they're too close to the infrastructure. So that's why I say, and in my experience, I've seen this very consistently over the last years as a, as a, a developer, in that all these properties along here, when they come on the market, they, they take a lot longer to sell. So in my suburb, the average turnaround for property selling is between four to six weeks. All these properties, um, you know, all these properties like sort of here, all these ones through here, they just take a lot longer to sell. They sit on the market because quite often all the cars from the main drag, um, the biggest problem there is parking because people come off the main drag and they park in all those side streets. So people's houses become a traffic congestion zone. They can't, you know, park out the front of their own house. They've got to walk up the street with five bags of groceries from Woolies to get to their own house. And that's a buyer objection. So when buyers are coming through and they're going to buy your renovated property off you, you have to think of those things because that's what the buyers will be thinking. You've got to put yourself in their shoes so you can think, geez, would I like to live here or not based on that? I know I wouldn't want to be walking up the hill carting five bags of groceries from Woolly to get to the front doorstep. So um, definitely a very important thing. Um, just going back to contaminated land, when you, do, um, when you do pick your area in the first place, do you check if there's, um, you can normally if there tell. Should, could be issues with it. Yeah, absolutely. Some suburbs you can tell if they've had a past industrial activity. As I said, um, they sort of termed it an urban renewal area. Um, you you can basically tell if uh, you know 
based on the past history. If it's been like a big industrial estate at one point in time, they're coming in bringing new homes, then yes, it'll be a contaminated site. But the reality is, as renovators, you won't be, you won't be targeting urban renewal areas um, because a lot of new housing is, is gone up. That's where they're knocking apart, um, old houses down and they're basically building high-rise development typically. And do you check before every project or before you purchase any block of land? Yeah, so this is part, you do this as part of your step number three, your property due diligence. Okay, yep. Absolutely. So all these are, what I'm discussing now is all the things you do before you buy the property. Because you might find it's contaminated, it's got asbestos, it's too close to the infrastructure. They're all buy objections that you can't overcome. So what we're doing here is we're flagging the things you need to check. And then at the end, with your, che with your, your checklist here, you're going you're to be ticking it and going, okay, the applicable, yes, um, contaminated, too close to infrastructure. So if you go through this checklist and you've got 15 things on there that are bad, are you going to be buying that property? No. If you go through that checklist and most of them tick off as okay, then it's a property that you pursue, you, step, you go to um, progress to step number four. Okay, avoid buying on main roads or busy thoroughfares. Guys, who would like to live on a main road or just even a busy thoroughfare? The only people that buy on main roads or thoroughfares are first home buyers who have no choice. No, they're not in a financial position to buy anywhere else. Um, a lot of um, new immigrants to the country buy on thoroughfares um, simply because they're so used to traffic on other countries. It's normal. Um, and the other people that buy is uh, people who just uh, have absolutely no idea what they're doing when it comes to property. So uh, yeah, please don't buy. Please don't buy on main roads. And um, at the end of the day, as I said, you're, you're appealing to who? Who's your target market? Owner occupiers, families, and they, you know, they want their kids to be able to, you know, run out the front yard and kick a football and not worry they're going to get squashed by some truck going past on a main road. So you've got to be careful of that. Even little things like roundabouts, proximity to roundabouts, proximity to traffic lights, because the reality is when a car stops, you know, mm, um, stops at the light, and then when they escalate, when they press the um, accelerator to go, you know, then the car... Rrr, and, you know, you don't want your property to be out the front of that, okay? Little things like that, buyers think of. Um, just going back to that previous slide, yep. if you actually... Um, find a property that's sort of towards the end of that block. And At you, the end of this, this first block here? Uh, yeah, and you said you wouldn't buy in that block because um, they take longer to sell. If you can overcome those buyer objections, like you try and work yes. out what they are, would you do, like say for instance, oh, I don't know, go underground with parking so that they actually have off street parking? Yeah, absolutely. Have you and done that? Yes. Um, with, uh, with your buyer objections, and I'm going to talk about this in step number four, the most beautiful properties for you to buy as renovators is a one, the properties with a heap of buyer objections, but the buyer objections that you can solve. Because what happens is people come through, so a lot of the properties that I buy are properties that, and I'll give you a class example, the, the properties that I buy, people come through and they go, oh, like they stink, they're half falling down, their floorboards are missing. I love the properties that say, Ent with the signs at the front saying, enter at your own risk. I love those ones because I know they're the ones I'm going to really make a mozza on. So people come through and they just go, oh, it's dis oh, it stinks. It's got no, the bathrooms, why is the bathroom right at the back when, you know, the lounge room's at the front here. Um, it's got no light, it's dark, it's dingy, um, blah, 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 blah. And so people, they go, oh. It's too hard, too hard basket. Everybody wrote off the current project that I bought. Everybody wrote that off. It went for a th uh, through a full auction campaign. Um, it got passed in and then it sat on the property for three weeks. And I came in after the three weeks marks and bought that property. I'll walk away with $700,000 net profit. I don't care if the planes are flying over. I don't care because it's still a great suburb. So, um, you know, some people, obviously some people are not going to like the, plant, the planes and that will be a buyer objection. So that's one I can't change as a renovator but I could also I, ch I could change the fact that it was a disjointed layout I could change the fact that um, it was contaminated I could change all those problems so the best properties to buy are the ones with a heap of buyer objections because if a property's got 10 buyer objections and you can overcome nine of them fantastic somebody might live with just that one depending on how severe overhead electricity lines Things like that, people are not going to live with that. So we'll talk about that soon. So there are some buyer objections that people will just not live with. Main roads, main road positions is definitely a major buyer objection. So that's why I'm saying don't ever buy on a main road or a busy thoroughfare. It doesn't need to be an eight-lane highway. 
just some suburbs people won't buy on. Like Darling Street. Darling Street's a two-lane road. It's not... You know, it's a main thoroughfare, but it's not an eight-lane highway, and a lot of people will not buy properties on Darling Street purely for the fact that it's the main artery. So you just got to work out how severe the buyer objection is. Okay, if you're buying a DA-approved property, now don't get tripped up on this, guys. A lot of agents say DA DA plans in the advertise, so you'll say um, so there's a big difference between DA approved plans and DA plans. I know people that have been tripped up in the past. So what DA, appro um, what DA plans are is where somebody has engaged an architect or a draftsman. They've drawn some nice, pretty architectural pictures. And they look all very nice. And they're selling the property with those DA plans. Now, it means that the, the concepts have been done, but they haven't been formally lodged. They can build the Taj Mahal, for all I care, and it doesn't mean, like, those, doc, those, pa those papers, those concept drawings that they draw are not worth the piece of paper that they're written on. When the plans actually get lodged in council and council actually stamp them approved, that's an entirely different thing. That means you are approved to actually build what's been drawn in those drawings. So don't make sure that if you are going to be buying a... Renovation, a renovation opportunity for a structural renovation because quite often a lot of people have no intention of going through the construction process. They will just get DA approved plans done and they will sell it as ready to go and there are certainly buyers that will certainly pay a premium for that. So you just want to make sure you buy DA approved plans, not DA plans. Yeah, I've, a number of times I've looked at properties that have had DA approval for something I wouldn't build. Is there a percentage that that adds to a property at all? Because they seem to, you know, the ones I've seen, they yeah. think, oh, it adds 100000 or something. It depends on the council, depends on the area. There's no magic formula, no. otherwise I would have given it to you. Yeah. Um, but the reality is it depends on the council how hard it is to get a development app approved. So, like, if you go to Byron Bay, for example, extremely hard to get a development application through, the, a year to, one to two years to get something approved through council. Now, for me as a buyer... I would actually pay a premium to have a property ready to go that I don't have the nightmare of wondering whether or not it's going, it's going to swing either way. So people will definitely pay a premium for that according to the suburb and how difficult the council is. You, the, the further out you go, like if you're going to go out into the regional areas, like I said, they don't even get development approval there. So people aren't going... <laughs> that's a classic example. So what they do is they're not going to place much value on a DA-approved property. As you start to move closer and closer to the city, the value increases. Because inner city council, in the, in the inner city councils... Because, so you've got to understand council, guys. In inner city councils... Every, all the houses are squashed together. They're very, very dense. And so councils tend to be very particular about what they do and don't allow because um, if they don't allow proper development, it actually sacrifices the quality of people living there. So that's why councils in the inner city areas in that 3 to 10 kilometre ring are tougher to deal with because people are living closer together. Out in the country, when your neighbour is, you know, 500 metres down the road, they don't care. Whether you have a slightly bigger house is not going to change their life, but in the inner city, it does matter.